Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Mark Mandel. Uh, I do developer advocacy for cloud for games. Uh, here I'm talking to you about Agones, scaling multiplayer game servers with Kubernetes, um, which is a fantastically fun title. There's a picture of me, and you can follow me on the Twitters. Uh, so I have more, more self-worth based on my Twitter account. Uh, that would be good, yeah. When I hit 5,000 followers, I thought I was going to feel good, but I would prefer 6,000. That would actually make me feel good. I'm sure it won't change next time it rolls around. Um, so before we get started, uh, I do want to ask all of you uh, about you all, just so we can, I think we can tailor this a fair bit considering the audience. I usually give this talk, as I was saying before, at video game conferences. Uh, they're so, there's different assumed knowledge, which is fun. So anyone here work in the games industry? That is not surprising. OK, cool. <laughs> so um, who here is not familiar with Kubernetes? Also, perfect. OK, so you in the back. That's OK. That's fine. Um, that's cool. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to give you probably some more background information about how certain types of multiplayer games work um, so that you can understand the project that it is we're doing. And I'm probably also going to talk, well, I am actually going to talk more about um, how we've extended Kubernetes uh, and why we extended Kubernetes to do the things that we needed to do for the workloads that we have for this kind of gameplay, um, that kind of stuff. So that kind of sound cool? Sweet. Awesome. So um, what I want to talk to you today is uh, about multiplayer games um, and very particular types of multiplayer games. Um, who here plays video games? Excellent. This explains a lot while you're here. Awesome. Um, <laughs> So there are a wide variety of different types of multiplayer games out there. The ones I want to talk about are your very fast-paced, online, competitive multiplayer games. So we're talking like Fortnite, Overwatch, uh, Rocket League, those types of games, right, where a lot of stuff happening, a lot of interactive physics, a lot of things going on between different players, um, that, sort of, that kind of interaction. And the example I'm actually going to use today is there's an a open source uh, first-person shooter called Synonic. Uh, that we're going to use as a demo. And what they do is do what's called a dedicated game server. Um, I'll show you what that means. Um, so a dedicated game server is wherein all your clients connect to this single simulation server somewhere on the internet, usually. Um, and that simulation server is your single source of truth of everything that happens inside the game. Right? It keeps track of everything in memory. It does all your physics simulation. It tracks what player input is going to be, usually through the clients. They usually send stuff down into the dedicated game server and be like, hey, can I move? Hey, I want to run forward. Hey, I'm firing a rocket. And it's up to that dedicated game server to track all the, the, the inputs and all the information that's coming from the clients and be able to say, OK, yes, this thing definitely happened. Yes, I sniped that person from across the room. Yes, I fired my rockets from my car and, and scored a goal, um, and send that information back out to their servers. Um, there's a variety of reasons that uh, this is pretty much the prevalent way of doing large-scale multiplayer games, uh, especially in AAA, like large, uh, large studio space. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into it. The major reason that we do this, well, actually, I'll say there's two major reasons for this. One is the authoritative nature. It gives us a lot of control over what's happening inside the game, helps us prevent with cheating, that kind of stuff. The other thing is actually latency control. Um, when we control where the dedicated server is going to be, we can look at how much time it's going to take for that information going from the client to the server and back again. We know how long that's going to be. We can track that. That's usually pretty easy. You can send a ping and return it. That's OK. And that means that if I'm playing a game with, say, someone in New York, I know as the game author, hey, if I put it in the middle of you know, maybe Central America, right? I'm playing from here on, the, on this coast, and we want to play with someone. If I put it somewhere in Central America, we're going to have a pretty Pretty similar ping time, pretty round trip latency. It's going to be about the same. Uh, we're going to have a similar play experience. And I'll know within my game, too, what sort of latency requirements I have. Usually somewhere between 50 and 100 milliseconds is, is not too bad. Below 50 is usually ideal. Um, but I can track that. Uh, so that gives me a lot of control, which is super, super nice. And so what we're talking about here is really like yeah, multiplayer games that are driven by dedicated uh, authoritative simulation servers, which a lot of them are. So. Um, sweet. How does this look traditionally? Like, what does this usually look like? Often for large-scale studios, they build this themselves. Um, this is a, a wonderful case of a lot of people reinventing the same wheel over and over again. So it would look something like this. So uh, you have a couple of players. They're like, awesome, I want to play a game. That sounds like a really good idea. So they usually connect to uh, some sort of matchmaker. 
Usually it's a pretty simple service. Well, it's not simple. Uh, it's just like in terms of like it's either a REST endpoint or something like that. Um, and the job of the matchmaker is to look through the entire player pool and see if it can find other people of similar skill levels, maybe look through people's social graphs, uh, usually a whole variety of, of different um, aspects and trying to find a good group of people to play a game on. That could be a whole talk into of itself. In fact, it could be several. Um, but once we have players who have been match made, what we need to do is find um, a dedicated game server process for them to play on. So usually the matchmaker talks to some sort of game server manager uh, that looks at, this probably sounds kind of familiar, a whole slew of virtual machines usually distributed around the world. This is starting to sound like Kubernetes. Uh, <laughs> you can see where we're going. But yeah, then, then it's its job to basically do standard scheduling type things. Uh, I know my simulation server needs about a CPU uh, to help run the whole simulation. I know how much memory it needs. Uh, so I start looking through machines and seeing which one has you know, available CPU and memory, and then I find the process. Um, but the big difference here as well is that once I've spun up this dedicated game server process, uh, and send that information back to the player, the players receive basically an IP and port they connect to. They're making a direct connection to that dedicated game server. And that's because, right, it's all in memory state. It's all shared. It's not, like, there's no way you can spin that out to a database fast enough. It's way too quick, right? We want to do this in, in like, nanoseconds. Um, so they make a direct connection to that dedicated game server. Uh, there's no load balancers, nothing like that. We don't want to introduce latency. Latency, bad. That makes bad player experiences, and people complain on Reddit. And nobody wants to com hear complaints on Reddit. Um, so that's usually how we set it up. So the part I want to talk about today is this bit. Um, how do we orchestrate, coordinate, um, and scale game servers around lots and lots and lots of machines? Um, and how do we do this in a nice open source way that can become a standard for lots of people who want to do similar things? So that's what a GONES is. Uh, it's an open source dedicated game server hosting and scaling project, right? So in the same way as you might want to scale, like host and run uh, a website using like say deployments and services on top of um, on top of standard Kubernetes, you can use Agones to host and scale these dedicated game servers for multiplayer games. And we'll look at how that how that looks like. So Kubernetes, yay! All right, we're all familiar with Kubernetes. Awesome. Um, so Agones itself is actually a native extension of Kubernetes. Uh, we use custom resource definitions um, as well as uh, API extensions as well, um, so that we can natively extend Kubernetes to basically make it so it understands how game servers work, which is like awesome. Um, the fact that this is a capability in Kubernetes is, is just absolutely phenomenal. And if that didn't exist, it would have taken us so much longer to make this project even vaguely a reality. Um, Kubernetes is actually also really important for, for this kind of workload as well, uh, for a few reasons which are really nice. Um, one of which is, is you know, the fact that we can run Kubernetes anywhere. Uh, the reality of games is that players show up in all sorts of weird places. Sometimes you just have a really big player base in Brazil. And I don't know if you know this, but cloud coverage in Brazil sometimes not so good. Um, so if you can run uh, a Kubernetes cluster, whether it be on-prem or like three different cloud providers or something like that, that means you can, it gives you a lot of power to reach players where they are. Um, and that's, that's a huge thing, because if you can't hit your latency requirements for your game, your players won't play and you won't make any money. That's that simple. Um, it's also a nice simplification to uh, traditionally the services that run dedicated game servers are usually quite different from, say, what you would run your traditional backend services for games, so like your account management or your virtual goods or your matchmakers, for example. Um, so this gives a single platform for you to run both your backend services for all your other game stuff, which you will have, as well as your dedicated game server workloads as well. Uh, which means less ops knowledge and less complexity, which is also super nice. Awesome. So let's look at this in reality. So uh, unsurprisingly, uh, we run game servers in containers. I don't think anyone's surprised by that, um, which is super nice. It uh, means you can run whatever you like inside your container. Um, we do have a, an integrated SDK. Uh, this is actually quite important for us. Um, game, surf, game server life cycles don't really fit the same traditional, um, the same sort of workflow as say like stateless or even databases. Um, game servers run this really interesting gamut wherein they go from stateless to stateful over their life cycle, which is a fun thing to manage and part of the, the, the complexity and part of the interesting parts of Agones. Um, so game servers are great in that like 
when you start one up and you have it just sitting there doing nothing, it's essentially stateless. No players are playing on it. Nobody cares if you delete it. That's totally fine. But as soon as you have players playing on it, they become stateful. You have a whole bunch of in-memory state that you need to manage and keep a hold of, and you cannot delete them. Otherwise, players get really, really mad when you interrupt their player games. Um, and again, then you get complaints on Reddit and all that kind of stuff, and that's awful. So um, the SDK functionality is really about allowing game servers to be able to control their own life cycles. So they know when they're ready. They know when they're able to accept connections. They know when they can shut themselves down because the gameplay is finished. Um, they can, uh, their health, health tracking inside game servers is a little bit different, so we have some inbuilt health um, SDK functionality as well, as well as some other just utility methods that are super nice. Um, we basically use more open source stuff. Uh, so we use gRPC uh, to basically build out the SDK integration. Um, hence, we can support a wide variety of languages, including uh, REST endpoints. Um, and we support the two largest you know, commercial engines as well, Unreal and Unity. Um, but we, like, we have people pumping out more SDKs kind of as we go, which is super nice. Uh, and we can do this pretty easily, thanks to gRPC and REST, um, which is super nice as well. So um, as I said before, uh, Agonez is a uh, extension of, of Kubernetes. So uh, anyone here not know what a custom resource definition is? Awesome, fantastic, that makes life really easy. Um, that's great. So when you install Agonez, now suddenly it understands what a game server is, uh, which is super nice. I can say to you know, Kubernetes, hey, can I create me a game server? I can do all the usual standard stuff around like, give it a name, we'll call it Synodic. Um, one of the things that Agonez does uh, is it does set up that direct connection for you. We do the policy management for you. Uh, Kubernetes won't do, uh, like, give me an open port between a range of 7,000 to 8,000 and connect that all up. Um, there is some stuff that are, that'll do that direct connection, but we need to manage the, the port management to make sure there's no collisions, things like that. Um, so here we can say, right, uh, here's a port I want, and it's going to be dynamically allocated, and the container's on 2600. So it'll go and create, it'll basically set up a host port connection for you automatically uh, so that you can go through the IP of the node and straight into the machine, and it works really nicely. And then here, this is basically a full pod spec, uh, but you're specifying the container that has your game server in it. Um, and that's pretty cool, and that's, that's quite nice. And so that can spin up, it's integrated with the SDK, it can tell when the game server is ready and ready to go, um, so we can play, put players on it and that kind of stuff. But um, the next thing that's kind of fun is that game servers are slow to start up. Uh, usually you're looking at a combination of binary and assets that's anywhere from a gig to three gig easily. Uh, you've got a lot of map data. Uh, you're probably pulling in things from a bunch of different places, uh, maybe some configuration information. You're probably doing A-B tests inside the game, all that kind of stuff. So what you actually want is you want a warm set of spun up game servers that are just sitting there and waiting for players. So what we have is what we call a fleet. Um, it looks a lot like a deployment. That's because it kind of is. Really what we have here is a fleet that has how many of these game servers do you want? It's that really simple. Um, and its job is to make sure you have this certain number of warm game servers up and running. And here's my spec for it. And you can scale it up and down, all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm not going to talk about it today. We have also some very particular types of auto scaling that we have in here as well um, that are particular to how games work. Uh, but we also integrate directly with the, um, the standard Kubernetes node auto scaler. Uh, so you can actually autoscale your fleets, and then you can use the standard Kubernetes autoscaler to adjust the cluster size based on how many things you have in your fleet, which is super nice. Um, and it, works out, it actually works really well. Um, they did a good job on that, which is super nice. So once you have um, this huge set of you know, game servers, maybe you have like 5,000 of them, 10,000, um, you, we need a way to be able to be like, hey, I would like one from that set of, of game servers that are currently running. I need one of those so I can put a player on it. Um, and I need you to like, atomically give it to me in like, a safe way. Um, and you know, I want to mark it so that I know that this one has players on it. So like, if you scale down the fleet or you want to roll out a new image to the fleet, uh, you don't delete it because you know, players complain when, when you shut things down. So we kind of break out of the traditional Kubernetes mold where we have this thing called a game server allocation that works like an imperative command. Um, under the hood, it's actually an API extension, if you're interested. Uh, we don't use a CRD for this. But in which you can create a, a game server allocation. Usually you would do this directly through the Kubernetes API, but I'm just going to show it in YAML because that's easier. Um, and you can 
provide a selector of game servers that you want to be like, hey, you have 1,000 game servers. Please give me one of those and mark it as allocated um, in an, an atomically safe way. And then I know that that's allocated and awesome. I know I have players on that and it's safe. Um, that's in its sort of you know, very special, the special mode, so I know that nothing's going to happen to it and I can make players play on it and it's great. Um, and I'm going to keep doing that. And eventually I'll run out, but maybe I'll auto scale up and that kind of stuff. But this is one of the, the sort of special things that, that Agones does for, for that kind of workload, which is fun. So, more excitingly, why don't I show it in action and hopefully it nothing will break? Should be good. All right, so I have an empty Kubernetes cluster. Sweet. Uh, so, to install Agones, um, I d usually I use Helm because it's the easiest. So I'm just going to do that. Run as slash run as. It's not particularly complicated. Uh, we have a chart. It does all the things it needs to do. There we go. It spits out a whole bunch of gobbledygook, which is fine too. Uh, and if I have a look, which I like to do. So there's, a, there's all the components for uh, Ghanaians that are running there. We have a, a variety of things in there. Um, so we have a controller, right? If you're familiar with like the operator panel, uh, pattern, sorry. Uh, so we have a bunch of CRDs, and uh, we have the controller that manages everything behind the scenes. So this means now we can do like get to game servers, which will say we don't have any. But like we couldn't do that before. And I, I mean, I love the extension stuff inside Kubernetes. It's it's kind of amazing uh, that you know all this tooling stuff comes for free. Plus you get the API extensions and the API all at the same time. Um, it's kind of magic. So let's create a fleet. Uh, fleet .yaml. So I'm going to create that, that Sonatic fleet we looked at previously. If we look at our game servers, we have two of them up and running, which is great. They've already marked themselves as ready, which is super nice. Uh, we can see we have IPs and ports for both of them. Uh, we can actually see what, what nodes they're on. They're on the same node as well, uh, which is also uh, ideal, um, which makes scaling. We pack them up tightly for scaling reasons. Um, and so they're ready to go. And we could connect to those. We could play games on them. But two game servers is boring. We can do really standard uh, Kubernetes type stuff. And we'll say 200. 200 is more, more like a, a better number. That seems like more fun. Um, so now like, we can treat that like a regular Kubernetes resource. And we can look at our fleet. And we can see things like, awesome. Like we have 200 of them are up already. Nice. Uh, 24 of them are ready. We'll see that number start to come up uh, a little bit quicker. Um, there we go. So that's, that's starting to grow, which is super nice. Now. Uh, we use another open source project called uh, Open Census, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, which will soon become Open Telemetry and all that kind of fun stuff. Basically, to do a whole bunch of inbuilt metrics as well inside this project. Um, so metrics are super nice in this, right? Day two, day three operations, like how many game servers do I have? What rate are they going up and down? Um, this is one of many dashboards that we have uh, that can see things like, okay, cool, there we go. That, that'll start to. That'll start to change. It's usually about 30 seconds behind. Um, and we can start seeing like how many game servers we have ready and all that kind of stuff. So this is all just Grafana. What just happened there? I did something. Doo -doo -doo. Last five minutes. That's better. Um, and we can see the rate they come up, all that kind of stuff. And we have a, a, a wide variety of metrics. Um, so again, open source standards, yay. Like we can just provide this foundational stuff uh, for game companies who want to do this kind of workload which is really nice. And because we use Open Census, which is also lovely, we can push this to Prometheus and Grafana. We can push it to Stackdriver, basically anything that uh, Open Census supports, which is super handy. There we go. So this actually says that's 200 there. That's tiny. You probably can't read it. Um, they came up pretty fast. They usually, we can usually do, we can usually spin up 10,000 servers and get them to ready, depending on the speed of the game server, in like a couple of minutes. It's not too bad. Comes up pretty nicely. Um, sweet. So let's do an allocation, uh, which is what we were talking about previously. So as you saw, like we can scale this up and down. They're all in a ready state, which means there's like no state in them, right? So no players are playing on them. So they're basically free to be deleted if we so desire, um, or the the operations management sort of does that. So let's do um, we'll do an allocation. And so in the allocation again is that that special state which says, hey, we have players on here. Um, we're just going to do it through here rather than through, uh, where are we, output YAML, through, through the API. 
which is nice, and it'll give us back a whole bunch of results. So this has actually gone and gone through those 200 game servers, picked an appropriate one, um, and given us back all the details about it. So here we can see we have an address, we have a port, um, we can actually see the, the game server name if we wanted to go look up more information about it. Uh, but let's do the fun thing, which is actually play a game. And so, like, this is, you know, done all the, the nice thing about this is also it's done all the hard work for us. You know, it's found all the appropriate machines where they need to run. Let's see if I can type multiple numbers. There we go, 307307. Let's see if I get that right. Yes, black screen is good. I don't know why they made that game that way. Um, so this is connecting up to a uh, Kubernetes cluster that I've got running, uh, to GKE cluster running. It is on this coast, actually. Uh, there's a bunch of bots sitting here playing. Um, I'm playing on a trackpad, that's why I'm so bad at this. I just wanna be very clear about that. It's got nothing to do with my real skill in games. Uh, where's, a, where's a series of bots? Come on, where are you? Oh, there's somebody. Yes, let's kill them. Um, and as you can see, like I'm playing a game like I would do normally. It's, everything's fine. What is this gun? Ah. But yeah, this is running on a gun as this is just running the dedicated game server, so we're all connected. Uh, the bots, in this case, actually, the bots are sitting in here. There we go. Ah, die. Excellent. Um, and so we can see it all works, and it's all it's all pretty pretty straightforward. Well, let's play with this a little bit more, so you can see what it is that I was talking about previously. Um, so we're going to do a couple more allocations. So, like, say my matchmaker right has found some more players who want to play. They have, they have some games they want to play. Um, we have a look at our fleet right now. We can see we have like three game servers allocated, and there's there's 200 there left. And so I just want to kind of show you like what this what this very special state means and, and why this works a little bit differently. Um, so say for example you were like, okay, we've got these people playing a game. Um, we need to wait for them to, to shut down. But we were like, oh, actually, you know what? We rolled out a wrong version of this, or you know what? Maybe no one's playing it, so we want to scale it down a whole lot. Uh, so let's, let, but we don't want to interrupt the the players that are currently playing. So. We're like, actually, you know what, let's, let's just drop it down to zero. That's fine. Let's kill it, all right? And so when we do this, right, all these game servers are going to start to scale down. But if we have a look at our fleet all over again, um, we can see those three game servers stay there, right? Until those game servers either uh, turn around and, and through the SDK to say, okay, yep, the game play's done. We finished our game session. Everything's cool. You know, this person won, so let's shut ourselves down. They're going to stay there. They're not going to go away. Um, I can specifically request that they get deleted, which is fine. That'll, that'll actually shut them down, which we can do. But they'll never go away until I do that. I can roll out a whole new version of the fleet. I can edit my fleet, much like a deployment, for example, and it'll roll out new versions. I can do the same thing inside here. We'll manage the, the, the fleet rollout and, again, make sure that no play is interrupted for those game players that are on allocated game servers. It's kind of the, the magic power of Agones. Cool. I'm not sure we have some time for some questions at the end. So this means, um, so we saw that, that sort of architecture we were, we were talking about before. Um, this means now that you're, you're a custom matchmaker, um, and we actually have another open source project called OpenMatch. Uh, it's a matchmaking framework if you want to do uh, open source matchmaking as well. So maybe it might be that. Your custom matchmaker can then talk directly to the Kubernetes API um, and basically be able to interact with it that way and say, you know, like, hey, uh, I've got players that want to play a game. Um, let me talk to this fleet, give me a game server so that these players can get play directly to game server. There's a lot less bespoke stuff that just needs to be built um, to manage your games at scale, which is super nice. We have a bunch of other stuff as well, obviously for time constraints that we can't cover. Um, a whole bunch of auto-scaling stuff, local development tools, a whole bunch of metrics we didn't show. Um, there was something I was thinking of, actually. Uh, it's gone. I don't know what it was. There, was. there was some other cool stuff that we have that's super nice. Oh, we have a bunch of latency uh, testing tools as well and all kinds of stuff that you just need. Um, there's all sorts of fun stuff in there, but, but we didn't get to play with that. But there's, there's goodies in there. Um, we're planning on going 1.0. Actually, it'll be next release. We release every six weeks. So it'll be September we're going 1.0. We've been working on this for about two years. Um, and we've been doing it. Actually, it's worth noting, we've been doing it in collaboration with a variety of studios. So we first. We first uh, created this in, in collaboration with Ubisoft. Uh, since then, I mean, Ubisoft still evolved, but we've had a, a wide variety of game studios get involved, which has been really nice. Uh, we've got a whole bunch more metrics and stuff we want to do, more performance improvements, a um, whole bunch of functionality improvements as well. Uh, and we're also looking at how we can support multi-cluster better um, in some really nice ways. And once uh, Windows hosting kind of 
penetrates all the cloud providers as well, we'll look at doing Windows hosting as well, which would be nice, because a lot of game developers use Windows. In fact, most of them do. Excellent. Um, if you want to learn more, uh, granis.dev, adagranis.dev is the Twitter handle, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we are actively looking for contributors, always, so if you want to play with a fun project on top of Kubernetes, please come join our Slack channel. Um, I will also make a note that down here, I've got my business cards. If you think you have questions and you're like, oh, maybe I'll think of them in three months' time, please feel free to, to grab some. And I've also got stickers down there, too. There are a couple of Agonis stickers still left down there that are holographic. So if that's your thing, that'd be cool. Um, sweet, we've got like nine minutes left for questions, which is really nice. Um, if anyone has any questions about how game servers work or uh, how we extended Kubernetes or any of the stuff that I've shown, I would be more than happy to answer them. Sweet. How do you handle like hardware stuff like uh, interrupts and stuff where it's like really sensitive that you like get the request in and out as soon as possible? So how do you handle hardware things? Really, honestly, we push that down to like whatever hardware that you run on, like that's kind of like whatever hardware you put your Kubernetes uh, instance on, then that's your hardware. Yeah, I mean, it's up to the engine and that kind of stuff. So different engines often usually have different uh, requirements for different hardware requirements. Like I've seen Unreal do some very interesting things about how they do tick rate checking uh, inside, inside the engine that is different from what I've seen in other engines as well. Um, and that, that way is where you get into fun things about um, assumptions that engines make about what sort of hardware they expect to be run on, whether it's actually the bare metal or whether it's cloud. And like, it, as soon as you step into the cloud, then you have a virtualization layer, and so certain things happen that way. Um, a lot of the cloud providers, myself included, um, have versions of um, machines that are essentially like you're running, you have the full socket, and you have that basically connect, direct connection direct to the hardware, um, rather than like, like I'll, I'll speak about Google Cloud because I know that one the best, but like our standard VMs, for example, you have a virtualized CPU, and so that can cause some um, latency issues. So to explain that, actually, let me take a step back. Um, when you're running dedicated game servers, having a very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A very, like, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Having, like, the same tick rate constantly. So usually a lot of game servers run either 30, 60, some 120 hertz, right? Knowing that that, that hertz rate is the same constantly is exactly what you want because then you know how much time you have to do your physics simulation, how much time you have to do to get your information out to your players, and that's super important. So if your underlying CPU is like doing this for how fast or how slow it processes things, maybe by nosy neighbor you have other things on the machine, that becomes a real problem. Um, and so like, there are solutions for that, whether it's you just own the machine that you run on, which is one, um, but you look at like what we run, uh, we have compute optimized VMs on GE, Amazon has something very similar that I've forgotten that I'm gonna assure Azure does as well, um, wherein we're like, nope, you have the whole socket, and so you, you control how much, how much of that CPU gets taken care of. Does that make sense? Cool. I can talk about game stuff for ages, go right ahead. Yeah. So are they, are they things that, that like game companies have kind of brought into this? And then a subsequent question, have they looked at you know, redesigning those perhaps to fit more into a Kubernetes type of model? Um, no, like if you build a game server today, it's going to be a gig, gig and a half. Yeah, like you have, there's so many assets in there and stuff. Like, so traditionally, I mean, it, it depends on how you build your game server. Um, if you're building on something like an Unreal or a Unity, what it actually has when you're authoring it um, is, is you're basically taking the client and you're writing either, like you split inside the client, you have splits of code where this is client only and this is server only. Um, because there's a lot of code sharing in between. And usually speaking, you're doing the same physics simulation, you want to have the same players, like the same sort of things that are happening. So you can strip a lot of it out, but you still have things like map data. Like what are all the maps that I'm playing on if I want to switch between maps? Um, you probably have a whole variety of data that gets pulled in into memory. So they just, they're just big. They're just big. It's just, it's just the reality of the situation. I've um, been having some really interesting conversations with a variety of game companies about how you could build more distributed, uh, dedicated game server type stuff. Um, that has other interesting problems, because uh, as soon as you start to pull that stuff apart, as we all know, like distributed systems are non-deterministic. Different things happen in different orders. When you're talking about gameplay, non-determinism is like a real problem, because like 
I maybe like one player gets a slightly different experience than the other, um, which sometimes is fine and sometimes isn't. Um, but also doing like replay, how do I know there was a bug or if there isn't, how do I replicate that becomes a real issue. So there's like all these pros and cons um, for how you can do that. Um, yeah, it's fun. Like you get into like, you know, your battle royale type games, right? You have 100 players, so that means you have a really big machine so that you can like load that up. Um, if you want to start getting into really big numbers, then you have to start distributing that workload. And that, that has some extra complexity as well. And it, yeah, it's, it's a whole thing. It's fun. Sweet. That's a really good question. I think, uh, so in my experience uh, for running this, most of them are just like, yeah, we're moving to Linux, that's fine. It's less, it's less, um, it's less uh, licensing costs, more than anything else. If you've got existing games that have been running on Windows for a really long time, they don't want to port those, I think, for obvious reasons. Um, the big fun thing with that, and one of the reasons like, Windows support is actually really important, is the very vast majority of game developers run on Windows. So we need to support Windows for QA builds more than anything else, just to get that iteration time down, right? So they're just going to be like, I have a build. Um, I need to be able to get it up and running um, within this system. And I just need to be able to drop the Windows version in. I'm not going to recompile it, wait another 15 minutes, or however long it takes. Um, that's just way too long on, on the iteration time. They can do that once they're like, you know, maybe do a daily build or something like that. But just to get that iteration loop down, uh, we need to have Windows support. That's super important for them. Three minutes and 17 seconds. Going once, going twice, going three times. Cool, awesome. Well, thank you so much for spending time with me and talking about game stuff. Um, I'm around for the rest of the day if you have other questions. Otherwise, yeah, uh, thank you so much for joining me and uh, have a great lunch.